Hi, welcome to Cover to Cocktails. Today we're going to talk about this month's book, The Hidden Life of Trees by Peter Wolobin. Um, So I picked this book. Uh, well, it's been on my, my reading list for a long time. I remember reading a review about it thinking, oh, this might be a really good book, uh, a really interesting book. Um, and I should say it's a nonfiction book, which is not my normal genre. Um, but I know Jen is really into horticulture and gardening, and I thought this might be right up her alley. And why not step outside my comfort zone <laughs> and try a different kind of book? Um, so I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I loved it. <laughs> thought you would. <laughs> I almost thought I'm like, I feel like this is a pick for me when you when you said it. I was like, yeah. <laughs> it, it was. Yeah, it kind of was. So, um, But before we get into the book, why don't we try the drink? I'm very excited to taste this one. Yeah. So this, um, as we posted in the middle of the month, our drink recipe, this is a drunken forest themed from the book. So we hope we enjoy. Let's have a taste. Oh, that's got a really interesting. It's good. It's really good. I usually when people are like, it's, it's really interesting. It's not a good thing. But it's got a lot of like different flavors, but you can kind of taste all of them like at different levels. Like, yeah, you know, I'm not like I said uh, when we were making the drink. I'm not a big fan of the limoncello, and that's what I'm mostly tasting here. Oh, so if I was gonna make this again, I might cut down the limoncello. Yeah. Um, or if you don't like limoncello, Susan, what you could do is um add like a little squeeze of like lemon to it to give you that lemon flavor, but not limoncello, right? You could that just would... do like gin and then just add a little bit of like squeezed lemon to it or like a little bit of lemon juice. Um, yeah. Yeah, that would be good. Yeah, because then you get that lemon flavor without the limoncello if you're not a limoncello fan. Yeah. But I can taste like the cranberries and like the piney, simple syrupiness. It's like the rosemary. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty good. Oh. You definitely, can you taste the pine in yours? I can absolutely taste the pine in mine. A little bit. You know, I thought I'd be able to taste, I thought it would be stronger. Um, How long did you leave your rosemary in your simple syrup for? I think it was two hours. I, I, forgot, can... I forgot mine in, in there for like six hours. I kind of forgot about it. <laughs> so maybe that made my simple syrup really strong. So, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, okay, cool. Let's, let's get back to All book right. reviewing. Our book. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, this was a nonfiction book. Um, and it was written uh, in nice short chapters and I found every chapter was very easy to read. Um, for me personally this isn't a book that I wanted to sit down and read in one go like I often want to do with fiction um, but it was a nice one to read a couple chapters and think about what he was saying and then read a couple chapters another day. That's a great way of putting it Susan. I felt the same way. It's not it's not as smooth of a read as you would get from like a nonfiction that gets you going from one chapter to the next, or yeah. sorry, a fiction book. Um, but it was very, very interesting and thought provoking. And I did appreciate that it was in short chapters where you could, like you said, read, digest, move on. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that. Definitely. Um, so I had a few, uh, I wrote down a few thoughts of some of the chapters and things that I found really interesting. So yeah. I'll maybe kick it off with one and then I'll see where you want to take us after. Okay. Um, yeah. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with the first chapter because that one is the one that kind of sucked me in and got me interested. Um, so the first chapter talks about friendships between trees. And I know you're thinking, well, a tree's a plant. Do they have really have friends? And Maybe not in the way we have friends, but it certainly seems like they take care of each other. Um, 
And it sounds like um, because our author, he he works in a forest in Germany. So he has a lot of varying experience with trees. And at one point he uh, saw a bunch of rocks in a circle on the ground. Yeah. So, well, that's weird. What's and what's happening here? And when he looked underneath, he found it wasn't actually rocks. It was a tree stump. And this tree had clearly been dead for four to five hundred years. But as he looked at it, it was green and it, the stump was still alive. And he couldn't figure out, like, why was this happening to this tree? And the only explanation they could think of was the other trees around it were keeping it alive. So what made that tree so special that the others around it kept giving it food and nutrition to help it stay alive? Um, I thought that was very interesting and kind of made me want to see what else is going on with these trees. <laughs> yeah, and this was a concept that was introduced to me. Um, okay, so I love uh, a podcast or an NPR show called Radio Lab. And um, I'll be posting uh, on our Facebook page a link to this podcast. Um, and it was one where they interviewed a woman. And she's actually in the book. Um, her name is Suzanne Samard. And she's from British Columbia. And she it's her story of how she got introduced into forestry. And she's done a ton of research into these connections that the trees have with the um, fungus in the ground and how that fungus connects all the trees. And it's just fascinating, her story. And it's done in a really um, interesting way through Radiolab. So I'm going to post that for everybody as kind of supplemental listening and viewing. And it's just really interesting to think of how not only can they share nutrients underground, um, but they can send messages to each other. Um, yeah. They're almost like a family. And, you know, I had heard about uh, the underground connections, but then he also talks about kind of like the sense of smell and how they sense like through the air, like warnings and stuff. <laughs> and I thought that was fascinating. And so for yeah. me, oh, go ahead, Susan. Oh, I was just going to say that was the next thing I had written down was about how they communicated through scent and um, through, through the ground. So yeah. it's a very, a very interesting fact. Well, and that all plays to one of the things that I really appreciated about this author as part of his writing style was how he connected everything he gave everything like a human persona or feel almost. And this is one of those things. So I just had some like examples. Um, so like the language of trees, like we were just talking about, like how they communicate and everything. Um, but another one that was really great was where he was talking about how trees age and he's comparing their bark to skin and how skin ages and how their bark ages because they're bark is smooth when they're young and then it gets wrinkled as they get older um and then he had one where uh oh my gosh okay it was in chapter 24 and it was he's talking about um trees and how sorry i'm gonna have to get the quote because this is really fun um it's a question of character and so it's these three trees these three oak trees yeah, that, that are living out there and they're all really close and he's like, okay, so if these trees are all living really close together and so they all have the same environmental impacts associated with them, if they behave differently, it's like an individual choice they're making. And he's like, there's the two that are kind of bolder, right? And they'll they'll hold off shedding their leaves in the hopes of getting more energy and then there's the one more reserved tree out of the three uh and how does he he calls it um the more sensible one uh it's yeah. anxious it's anxious but sensible um and it sheds its leaves earlier because it doesn't want to get frost um hit by frost and i'm like you can relate like i'm the anxious tree that's more sensible that's what <laughs> Say I was. I'm like, yeah, that's me. If I was a tree, I'd absolutely be worried about everything. I'd be like, no, 
not going to freeze this year. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, I'm not risking it. No, we're going to go the safe route. We're going to make sure. (laughs) And I did appreciate, um, because I feel like in my relationship with Corey, he'd be the bold tree and I'd be the sensible tree and I'd be like, no, we're doing it this way. And he's like, take the risk. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But in the book, I'd appreciate that he said that the, the, more sensible, anxious trees were probably doing it more right as climate changes and things like that. And I'm like, all right, it's good to be a sensible tree. (laughs) And, you know, that really made me think about, um, it was what, like seven or eight years ago here and we had a snowmageddon when it snowed super early, um, like early September before everything had, like the leaves were still green. And there's no way the trees could have predicted that. And I don't think even the sensible, anxious ones, there was no chance for them to be saved from that, uh, all that snow. Um, That really, that destroyed a lot of the trees in the city. Yeah. Um, So, yeah, that came to mind a few times when he was talking about trees and their leaves and they're not freezing. And oh man, those poor trees. I know. (laughs) it makes yeah. you think about them differently, right? Like you see things like that now and you're like, oh, kind of poor trees. And I think that's what he did really well. Like in, I think in the way he personified trees, it made you have like a connection with them. Like you could see their almost human qualities and it made you appreciate them more. Like it was yeah. chapter 27, it was the street kids one. And yeah. I felt so bad for the street kids. Like, Oh my God, I feel so terrible for the trees in my yard. <laughs> I know. I'm like, I, I don't know if I can like look at all the streets down the boulevards anymore and not just feel so sad for them instead of being like, oh, they're pretty. It's like, you guys are kind of leading a half life, aren't you? Definitely not leading your best life. Like, yeah. They are there friends with anybody? I know. Um, yeah, like all the ones on the boulevard, I know a lot, lots of them are the same species, so I yeah. hope that they talk to each other. Um, and then, like in my backyard, I have a lot of spruce trees, and I hope they're friends. But I mean, who knows? <laughs> Maybe they're all just poor, sad, lonely trees. Right. And they're not growing up the way they should, he says, you know, like they usually have like the mother tree and the mother tree supports them. And you're like, oh, because he has like a whole like chapter 20, 21 talks about like mothers and young and how the mother trees teach them things, right? Like they teach them things that they shouldn't be doing lessons when they're younger so that they grow properly and they know this like tree etiquette that he calls it. And I'm like, these young, sh- these these street trees, these street kids just never get that etiquette lesson. And you're like, oh. Yeah, you know, like the trees in my yard are probably 60 years old. And we keep thinking, well, they're like, they're probably going to die soon. But if they were in a forest, they'd be babies. Yeah. But. Well, and it's interesting because we were going to put, we, we had a tree taken down out front here last summer and I was thinking of a new tree to put in. And this has totally changed my frame of mind of like what kind of tree to plant there because most, there's a lot of trees that are well suited for forests, but he did mention that there are some trees that are kind of like loner trees. And I'm like, oh, maybe I should consider getting a loner tree so he's not like a sad street kid, right? Oh, man. Yeah, we're due to get another tree in our front yard <laughs> um, in the fall. The city's going to come plant another tree in the yard. Can you and choose? We, Do they let you choose what tree? Yeah, we can out of a list, but we've already chosen. So now, I mean, I can't go back and say, oh, no, no, <laughs> one needs friends. Let me choose that owner. <laughs> <laughs> Could you imagine calling your city and being like, excuse me, I need to change my choice because I don't want my tree to be lonely. <laughs> now I need to do a little bit of research so there it's a maple that we're going to put out there um, okay. so yeah. I, now I have to research and see if maples need friends or not it right. will have a maple across the across our sidewalk so maybe they'll be buddies I don't know <laughs> yeah <laughs> now I feel I feel so so bad for the ones that are on like sidewalks downtown yes 
like you already know they have a horrible life with people walking by and um the salt yeah. that sprays in the winter or um cars hitting them or people pulling on them like but to yeah. think of how, like how tough they have it to actually spread roots underground Gosh. yeah yeah and you see them get replaced so often like oh that one's not growing gotta put in a new one and, you and think I know that more, like we want the cities to be beautiful but yeah. like these poor trees <laughs> well and you think that these are trees that should be there for hundreds of years and they're not they're just yeah. not because they're just not living good lives and you're like oh <laughs> Yeah, and you know, it's funny, um, I don't know if you had this experience when you lived out here, but um, here, baby trees grow all the time. Like, I have baby trees growing on the steps of my deck in the spring. So, mm -hmm. clearly, this area was meant to be forested, because they just, right. everything just grew so easily here. Yeah. Like we When we moved here, two little trees started growing in the backyard, and we just let them grow, and now they're, like, taller than the house. And they're buddies, but one is a little curved, a little bit drunken, probably. Um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so we probably should have taken them down, but I think they're like best friends. So I don't yeah, want to. They're buddies. Wanna... <laughs> <laughs> one of my favorite personifications that he does is um, in chapter 28. I'll see if I can figure out what the name of the chapter is. Um, oh, Burnout. And he's talking about uh, silver birches, which are kind of like loners and they'll like, they'll colonize like a burned out area first. Um, oh yeah. But then the other trees will eventually come in and start growing up. And uh, oh, this was great because he's talking about how the silver birch would like whip out and lash the other trees. And I can just picture it, right? Like, just like a slap, like, get out of here, right? Like, oh, that's amazing. <laughs> so he provided, like, these really great visuals where I would just, I would, he describes something in what is very, like, a human personal way, but you can just picture, like, these trees doing this stuff. It was, it was so good. Yeah, I really yeah. liked that aspect of his writing style. I think it made it a little more interesting to read, for sure. Definitely. Um, yeah, and this just happened to come to mind when he was talking about the forest fires. Um, because he was, I, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, I believe he was talking about in Europe and um, in parts of the States, forest fires are not like a natural thing for those forests to go through. And I kept thinking about, um, our forests here where um it is natural for there to be forest fires yeah. and he i think when he was talking about that it was in europe he found that most of them were human um yeah. induced where i think in california it's similar to canada where you can get natural ones the bigger issue that he was talking about is that we go and put them out right away so in natural settings, you, the fire would just be let to burn and it wouldn't burn very hot or large um, because it didn't have like all this kindling underneath almost. Um, yeah. Because you just let it burn small occasionally and it would clear all that out. But because we put these fires out, it just builds and builds and builds with all this kindling, which then causes these like inferno fires. So... Yeah, and you know, I think here um, near the mountains, <laughs> they do controlled burns, like they let the forest yeah. burn every once in a while because they have to just to allow it to regenerate itself. Um, yeah. No, I don't know about it, but. Because there are yeah. some trees that that's how uh, they reproduce. Their seeds yeah. need <laughs> fire. Awesome. Their seeds need fire to open. The cones need fire to open and spread their seeds. So, yeah. That's kind of interesting. Um, Was there anything else about like his writing style? I had a few things that I really appreciated about his writing style. One was like he always inserted these fun quotes. And I'm just going to go back to chapter 12 because it was my favorite. It's the mighty oak or mighty wimp. And he, he I'm not even going to attempt the German pronunciation because these are all like German phrases that he then translates over to English, which I thought was really kind of fun. Um, but 
this one German phrase, he's talking about um, whether oaks are like, I don't know, mighty or not. Uh, mm -hmm. And there's this German phrase, which roughly translates as, it's no skin off an old oak's back if a wild boar wants to use its bark as a scratching post. <laughs> I'm like, oh, that's, that's a saying? Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like an old boar right you know it's very <laughs> german in terms of like you know boars in their forest and stuff. yes um and so i just he has a few of those inserted throughout the book which i i appreciated it was this really kind of great humor added into it <laughs> yeah it i think it was written really well and um when i was looking him up afterwards i found he's written a lot of books like not just about oh. forests, um, also about animals, um, okay. living in the forest. Um, so if you enjoyed it, definitely something else to check out. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it was a very European book because he's from Germany. So um, talks about a lot of trees and I don't, I don't know if, I don't know a lot about trees, but lots of times I was kind of wishing for a uh, North American view just to be, uh, yeah, you know, you just know, to really live more to where was, we we're living. I was going to ask you this question, Susan, because he, he mentions it in one of the chapters, uh, which is, I can't remember, oh, chapter 13, um, about beaches, because his forests seem to be very beach dominated. And I was yeah. like, Susan, have you ever seen a beach in the wild? I don't think so. I was, I meant to look it up, but I don't think so. I don't know that if we have them here. No, because he says, and I wouldn't have thought of it, but he says in chapter 13 that like the Canadian area, Siberia is too cold for beaches. And I was like, I wonder if Susan's even seen a beach before. I don't think I have. No, because yeah. I, I kept trying to relate it to like trees that grow around here. And Right. Yeah. And I had, you know, to be fair, I had never seen a beach until, um, or even maybe I had seen it, but not really realized what it was, having not had them around for the majority of my life, um, yeah. until I moved to Michigan and we started hiking. And there are a lot of beaches here. And I remember we were walking through a forest one day and I was like, what is this tree? And I'm trying to, to like figure it out. I'm trying to identify it. And I just couldn't, like, I didn't have a reference of what it even was. Um, it kind of reminded me of a giant sumac, but I knew that wasn't right. And then we came across an interpretive panel on the hike, and they were talking about, you know, the beech trees in the area. And I'm like, oh, that's got to be what it is. And so I looked it up after, and sure enough, and, and I see them all the time on our hikes out here now. Um, but otherwise, I would have never seen, I would, I would not know what they looked like. They're yeah. cool trees. Because, I mean, I can't tell you what the, all our species of trees are here, but even um, like a maple tree, like a Canadian maple leaf tree, I have never seen one before. They don't grow here. Oh, things I never thought of, right? Um, have you never been? You've traveled um, out east, though, haven't you? Uh, a little bit, yeah, but not like... I think I was in Toronto once. I was in Ottawa right. once. Um, you weren't paying never, attention to the trees. I wasn't able to think about that. Like, <laughs> I was a teenager. Yeah. Um, and then in the Maritimes once, but again, I wasn't paying attention to the, yeah. to the tree. So um, now funny. I will. <laughs> maples, are, maples are very pretty in the fall. They're very nice. They have a, usually a red color, which... Um, I appreciate it because he, you know, this was one of the fun facts of the books was how or why tr tree leaves change color. Because through yeah. my horticulture classes, I learned that the timing of it, I mean, it's, he talks about how it's temperature and light, but then when a tree realizes that it's time, it sends out a hormone and that hormone tells the tree that this is time to do that. And I learned about that, but we never learned about why the leaves actually change color. So right. I thought that that was like fascinating that they break down the chlorophyll and then draw that in. So, I mean, 
they're green because the chlorophyll is reflecting green light, but without that chlorophyll, mm -hmm. then they're um, reflecting this other colors. And those yeah. colors tell insects, don't eat me, I'm toxic. And I'm like, that's just really, um, it was really interesting. Um, I thought that was one of the other things I loved about his writing was that he was really good at explaining scientific terms in ways that were easy to understand. So, yeah. <laughs> so that was one. Carbon dating was another one. Uh, I, I think he had the best explanation or layman's term explanation of carbon dating that I've ever, ever read. I was like, oh. I get carbon. I mean, not that I had not didn't realize, but I'm like, this is a great. I, I told Corey, I'm like, this is a great explanation of carbon dating. Yeah. 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 He had some really good stuff in there. Um, Did you find that like because, um, as in like a non science person, it's you know I have a bit of a science background, so for me it's one thing. But like for you, did you find was there any of the stuff that was kind of like over your head, you didn't get it? Or did you really feel like he did a good job of explaining stuff? No, he did a really good job because I mean, clearly I'm not a scientist. Um, so yeah, it was easy to read. It was very easy to understand. Um, there wasn't anything that I was like, what is he talking about? Because he did a, such a good job of explaining and relating it back to humans. Um, so I think a really good way to capture it was all his, as we've said earlier, um, all his thoughts about how, like, you could turn, make make it seem like a tree was a human with all the references back, like yeah. the skin, the way they're communicating, um, the way they're growing up with their moms. So, yeah, it, yeah. we did a good job. Were there any, like blow your mind things where he was like this is what trees do and you're like I would have never guessed and that just blew my mind a little bit about trees um well what did I write down in here I wrote some stuff about their etiquette um and how they have to grow a certain way and um how only like those poor baby trees who wait forever for yeah. there to be something and then finally some light comes through and they're like, yeah, it's my time. But then other trees will beat them to it. <laughs> How disappointing, right? Oh, right, you've waited forever and now you're going to grow and then, oh, the other trees just covered up the hole. So... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. More trees. <laughs> um, I think there were, there were a few things that were just, like I never, never thought of. And it was one of the things was the color thing, but um, his talk of like intelligence in trees, it wasn't just communication. I mean, he talked about the communication, but he also talked about the intelligence and that kind of blew my mind where they're discussing where uh, they, you could almost think like they're sending electric pulses through their system. And I mean, that's similar to us in what we do with our brain and our nerves and everything. And the memory that like they they can remember stuff, right? Like he talks about that. And, and so he implies this certain level of intelligence that they have. And to me, that was a little bit uh, mind blowing to think about that I hadn't thought about or heard about before. Yeah. Yeah, it was pretty cool. Um... Yeah, I can't remember. My mind just lost what I was going to say. Um, <laughs> uh, you know what else I liked about it was um, how he also related it to the animals and other creatures that live in the forest and, yeah. um, and help the trees. Like one of my favorite parts was about the woodpeckers yeah. and how, the, uh, I mean, this is not good for the tree, but how the woodpeckers go in and they create a home. And then they create another room and another one because they can't have just one home. <laughs> Damn and, woodpeckers. <laughs> yeah, well, a woodpecker and I have had a feud a few times because <laughs> one instance. Um, of course you have. They're, they're pecking on our uh, chimney. Like, oh. why? So anyway. <laughs> But yeah, I really like that part. And then you can see how like the poor tree is damaged forever. 
because um, as he explains, while the tree can send out um, defenses, uh, because they move at such a slow pace, they're probably not gonna be able to stop the woodpecker, right? Because it takes like 10 years for them to close like an inch size gap in their bark. Yeah. And the woodpeckers go into town, right? So the woodpecker builds their homes and then the fungi get in and they start taking over from the inside. Um, and so we know the tree is doomed. But when a tree is doomed, I mean, they're still going to be around for another hundred years, probably. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, and then I liked how, so the woodpecker makes their homes and then they decide, oh, we don't need these anymore. Oh, they're too big now. And then somebody else moves in. So like the chickadees come in and they build their nests and they fill it with mud and have their, their nests. And then it gets bigger and the owls move in. Um, and then the bats might move in. And then all the other animals that are uh, benefiting from the tree dying. So I really like that part. Not that the tree's dying. I really like the. <laughs> <laughs> you don't like the murder aspect of it, but you know. <laughs> the apartment complex that it creates for all of these other animals is interesting. Yeah, I like how they were able to help all the other animals in the forest. And then once the tree does die, and falls over um, all the other creatures that the dead tree helps. And if yeah. you would go into the forest and remove that dead tree, um, you're losing all those creatures that are so beneficial to the forest. So, Yeah, and I loved his perspective on some of like the insects, like the um, mm -hmm. beetles and things. And then this, like he talks about like mealybugs and scale, or not, not mealybugs, I don't think, but like aphids and scale and yeah. stuff. Because I deal with those on a different level with plants at work. And yeah. so when he's talking about how basically, I, I don't know if you've ever dealt with aphids or scale, but yeah. they have that sticky goo that's all over everything. And it's yeah. basically their poop. And I'm like, oh, well, that's good to know. Next time I have to clean off all the stickies off of my plants at work. <laughs> this is scale poop. Yay. <laughs> and I love that the ants in the trees, I mean, they love they love the scale and aphid poop. That it's like their thing. And that they will basically like take care of the of the aphids because they want it, right? I thought that was very um an interesting perspective that applied to what I do for work. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that was pretty good. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I have a question, but I'm going to save it to the end. So if you have anything else you want to talk about, we can go through that. But I, I have a question when we're when we're at the end. So just let me know when we're there. <laughs> one other. I think we've talked about everything except this one other thing that I thought was very interesting. Um, how he's talking about trees starting to move north. Um, yeah. And because the, the climate's changing, the trees have to move to where they can survive. Um, and of course, trees, um, they live in such a slow time period compared to us. This northward track is, it takes a long time for them to get there. Um, but because we're in a, climate uh, or temperature increasing part of our timeline, the trees are going north, but when an, an ice age comes in, the trees go south. So I thought it was kind of neat to see how they they adapt to uh, their situations as well. Cause we, in our minds, I think we think um, like trees are just there forever, right? Where the forest has always been there, but really they're moving. Yeah, and you know, it's interesting because you, because everything with trees is so slow, um, it's not like you know a lot of the rest of us who are all the rest of the, a lot of the rest of the other species that are going through evolution um, that might evolve faster because they're going through generations faster. Um, yeah. Trees do not go through generations very fast, so you think that they would evolve a lot slower, but. Um, and they do, but it, it seems that they've created, according to the book, these other um, factors where they are, as a tree, an individual tree, they are more easily able to adapt to their surroundings. 
um, than yeah. maybe other animals that are, you know, you, they, you push them like a little bit out of their comfort zone and that's it, right? Like they have trouble adapting to it where the trees being so long lived and having to go through all these potential different environments, they're like, no, I'm just going to adapt myself. I don't need to like evolve. <laughs> I can just. I can just adapt <laughs> and live for another thousand years. It's it's incredible, right? It really yeah. is. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I have a new appreciation for trees. And um, as I do my daily walks around the community, um, I now I'm looking more at the trees. And when um, I'm sure when we head out to the mountains this summer, um, I'll be watching those trees a little more closely and yeah trying to see some of these things and you know because there's this one thing I can't remember what um oh he had some fun facts in there one was about tannins in wine which I loved where apparently tannins like the, the tannins in the wine from like the oak barrels and stuff um it's something that the trees develop it's a toxin against a uh, fungus and insects which I thought yeah. was great but one of the other fun facts he had um, was the acoustic ability of wood. And he was like, yeah, next time you're out in the forest, go and like, have you stand yeah. at one end of the tree and have someone stand at the other and knock. And he, I'm like, you just know that I'm going to be making Corey do that next time we go out in the forest, right? Like there will be a yeah. felled log and I'll be like, Corey, go stand at the other end and knock. And I'm going to be sitting there with my ear. Yeah, take some pictures of that. <laughs> Yeah, they'll be in our calendar. They'll be they'll be on the card that we send out for New Year's. <laughs> oh, so good, so good. Yeah. Um. Okay. So. Oh, and I have to say the other fun fact that I thought was amazing. I have to bring this up. Was one of the quaking aspens that was gigantic. It was a tree that took up the root system took up a hundred acres. It was an aspen in Fish Lake National Forest in Utah. And the root system was a hundred acres in size and it had 40,000 trees that it sent up from that root system. One yeah, tree. That was so, yeah, that was really cool. That was mind blowing. I was like, yeah. what? That's crazy. Yeah, and when it, I mean, side story, but when we talk, when he talked about the quaking aspen, all I could think of was the quivering aspen that we saw when we went to Cyprus in grade seven. <laughs> <laughs> and our little walk through the forest in Cyprus and all the trees that kept shaking every time the yeah. wind went through. <laughs> and I mean, we have to let our viewers know, they have to understand, Susan and I grew up in southern Saskatchewan. <laughs> There aren't any forests in southern Saskatchewan. Like, let's be real. Like, you can tell somebody, like, so where we lived in Alberta, we would have to take the number one highway home. And if you said to somebody, I'll meet you by the tree on the number one highway outside of Swift Current, everybody knew what tree that was because there aren't any other trees on the number one highway around there. Like, <laughs> so... It's not like we grew up with forests. Like it just, we just didn't have them, right? So. Um, no, it's a very hard place to grow trees. Yeah. Like my parents plant a lot of trees <laughs> in their yard and they have a heck of a time keeping them alive. Like they don't grow. That's why out here when friends. They, <laughs> they plant a ton of trees. They should have some like kind of friends maybe. Right. But like out here, the trees just grow. Yeah. So totally yeah. different environment right yeah yeah all right so i'm going to ask my question okay. what is your favorite tree susan what's my favorite tree? what's your favorite tree well we used to have this beautiful willow in our in our front yard um, it would have been a really great climbing tree like a giant giant tree um, but it started to die as we lived here, and the snowmageddon uh, took it out and fell over. So that one was beautiful. I do love the willow trees. Um, and I also really love flowering trees, like the yeah. cherry trees or apple trees. And in my front yard, where we're going to plant another one, we have one called a uh, hot wings maple. 
Oh. Has uh, red flowers. Oh, nice. Yeah. So is I, it, does I it, do... Sorry, does it flower really early in the spring with little red flowers? No, it flowers late in the year. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, the only problem with it is we planted it like six years ago and it's still teeny tiny. Like it still looks like it, <laughs> it's like a baby. So. <laughs> well, he is a baby still. We learned. <laughs> baby but I was really hoping it would grow up a, like grow taller but it, exactly. they're not supposed to be super tall they're supposed to be wide so oh, oh interesting yeah awesome. yeah so what's your favorite tree I you know I posed this question to Corey and then we had the discussion and I feel like you had a lot of great ones that I love that I didn't even think of um but there were some that immediately came to mind uh one was a ginkgo which I had Ooh. never seen till I moved to the States. And it's a very common like street tree, but it goes back really, really far in the fossil record. So I had seen fossils of it before I'd ever seen actual trees because I worked in the Paleo Museum. So I had seen like fossil imprints of it, um, but it's got really cool, unique leaves. So if you look up ginkgo, they're awesome. Um, cool. One of my other favorites is we went to, we, we, we were lucky enough to go to uh, Sequoia National Park in the Sierra Nevadas a number of years ago and see like the giant sequoia trees. That and like so cool. literally like, so there was one that had fallen over and pioneers had turned it into their house. Like it was that big, the circumference and you could walk through it and like Corey could almost, and Corey's six four, and he could almost walk through it without ducking. Like it was that gigantic. Like there's one you could drive your car through. Like it's insane. Um, but I think one of my favorites that I just love when I go out in the forest is um, hemlocks. They they remind me of if you haven't seen pictures, they're like a very they're like the disheveled cousins of like the cedars or the pines, like. <laughs> They're just so fun. And we were lucky enough also, there's in Northern Michigan, they have an old growth um, cedar and hemlock forest. And so we were able to go hiking and camping in this old growth hemlock and it was pretty amazing. So what I might do is I have pictures of Corey and I like hugging an old growth hemlock. <laughs> so I might post that so people know and I, I have some of the giant sequoias so I might post some of those on our Facebook and if you have pictures of you with your fun trees or pictures of your trees I'll post those for you as well yeah I'll look for some yeah absolutely <laughs> I, I can't pick any right now because there's no leaves on any trees right now so it'd be a pretty bad picture right yeah yeah. yeah, in a few months. I'll have some good ones in a few months. <laughs> nice. <laughs> okay, so do we want to rate our book and our drink? We better do the rating. How um, are you? Did I did I talk enough this time so you had opportunity to drink? Where are you at? I'm oh. doing better this time, yeah. Yeah, we're about at the same. That's awesome. Good, yeah. So um, you want to do the book? What What do you think about the book? Uh, so I'm probably going to give it a three out of five, but that's mostly because I'm not a nonfiction girl and I, I just didn't want to sit down and read this one. Like I read, probably read three or four other books while I was reading this one, wow. which is not what I normally do. <laughs> um, it, like it was good. It was very interesting. Um, I have a new appreciation for trees, but I'm just not an into nonfiction. So yeah, probably three star book for me. <clears throat> and you know, I'm probably, um, I'm gonna say it was about a four for me because I really did learn a lot and it was interesting, but yeah, I'm not usually, I agree, a nonfiction. So it was a little um, tougher of a read for me, but I learned a lot and there was there was a lot of interesting stuff. Um, so it was really I, cool. Yeah, it was really um, kind of an interesting book. So I'm going to give it a four. So, yeah. Cool. Okay. All right. Drink. 
the drink, I'm going to finish mine. <laughs> so I'm probably going to give this one a three. Um, mostly because I'm not a big fan of that limoncello. So gotcha. I'm probably gonna, I'm going to try to make this one with maybe some lemon juice. Yeah. Instead, give me how it. Yeah. Um, and you and know maybe. Um, is instead of the cranberries being muddled, maybe just some cranberry juice. Yeah, you know, I thought about that because I was having a hard time finding cranberries and I was like, what is another option? And um, the other option I thought of was uh, cranberry juice. I might muddle more cranberries in it next time to get more of a cranberry flavor to it. But I was, I'm pleasantly surprised by like how much of like a piney, earthy flavor it has, at least mine does. But again, maybe it's because I soaked my rosemary in the simple syrup for six hours. <laughs> so, um, so I'm going to give this one probably a three and a half. Uh, I would definitely make it again. I did enjoy it. Um, but I don't know if it would be like my go to, like on a, on a you rainy know, uh, Sunday. This would be a really good Christmas drink when we're allowed to have parties again. Yeah. Look, this would probably be a really good one for Christmas. It just yeah. looks crispy. Absolutely. Like it looks really amazing. So I was really, really does. happy with that. And so Susan, do you want to tell us now that we've done our ratings? Um, do you want to tell us a little bit, um, we've chosen our book for next month and normally we would just announce it on our Facebook page, but we understand that maybe some people are only watching our YouTube channel. So anybody who's watching the videos, you're going to get like a little insider note at the end of each of these ones <laughs> for what the book is next month. So do you want to just tell us what our book is next month and then so, you can sign us out. So here's our next book. It's called When No One Is Watching by Alyssa Cole. And uh, it looks good. Exciting. We'll find out. Um, yeah, so until next time, have a drink, read a book, and be happy, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>